quite a fascinating subject under a broad title like management. I'll start with a single anecdote to illustrate its importance and complexity. Once in our company, when it was still quite young, and even now, actually not very old, but very young, but when we were even younger as an organization, a girl joined us in the company who had previously worked in very large, mature old companies. After collaborating with us for a period of one and a half to two months, I inquired about her emotional state. She stated that she did not comprehend how everything operates in any way. This is entirely different from what I had previously, but it manages to function and operate somehow. And actually today I want to talk about management, about the specifics of our management, but of course I will not retell books about management because there are a huge number of them and it would be completely self-confident to try to give you something fundamental about management in an hour, although a huge amount has already been written about it. Great books. Overall, we're a young organization, and for 12 years we've been growing rapidly, sometimes lacking time to learn management. Our company's leaders, managers, and executives often lacked experience due to our rapid growth and the need for quick decision-making in a fast-paced environment. And obviously in the future and currently we have to systematically analyze management because it is genuinely a science and a lot of knowledge that we can acquire by making a large number of mistakes, paying the price for them, can be obtained from books. Simultaneously, naturally, we will persist in making errors. However, why choose a lengthier path when there is an immense amount of already existing generalized knowledge available for us to leverage and learn from? Hence, it is not the objective of this lecture to provide you with the fundamentals of management. Furthermore, the globe, business, and organization are undergoing constant transformation. Everything has changed and will continue to change. Probably, this is the first insight that I want to convey to you, that there are no universal management frameworks that can be applied always and forever. Even within the company, I believe that we should have different systems, models. Within the framework, I comprehend a template or model that has been created by an individual. Management that can be applied. And depending on the product, depending on the specifics of the business, the market, the stage of product development, or the team, because we have inside, even in our company now, there is a mature business, there is a growing business, there is a business at the startup stage. Completely different models can be applied and holocritical models and models of more centralized leadership and jail and waterfall. It all depends on the specifics. However, there is something that remains constant. The principles remain constant. What are principles? These are a set of fundamental principles, axioms, that remain unchanged. They are not associated with flexibility. These are the main ones provisions on which the management system is constructed. And I have confidence that our management has principles and it is about those principles, about something unique that I want to discuss today. What is the basis of Dodi's management? It is clear that the company will experience development and growth in the future. This lecture is a form of generalization that encompasses my experience, my thoughts and my insights. However, it is evident that the factors that have enabled us to attain our current outcomes encompass certain distinctive elements which hold the potential to be advantageous for us in the times ahead. These are a few principles of our success, principles of our management. So I am starting. The primary and fundamental statement I want to make is that our management philosophy is firmly rooted in trust in people. What does this mean in practical terms? From the very beginning, I have consistently built a business, a company with individuals whose eyes are burning that is, people who are deeply interested in doing what they do because they have a strong sense of purpose, they have genuine enthusiasm. These are individuals who are sincerely involved and dedicated to the business. In fact, this approach has predominantly determined the functioning of our management and will continue to determine it in the future as well. It is based on the assumption that individuals behave in accordance with the belief that individuals act with the best of intentions in mind. This is the foundation of trust, when the management system is constructed not by coercing people to take action, then monitoring them, 
but by unlocking their potential. In general, maybe these are two perspectives of the world. The first impression is like a glass. It is half full or half empty. In principle, it's a matter of looking at the same thing from different sides. An individual holds the belief that people, so to speak, are unconscious, lazy, and the management system needs to exert control in order to motivate them to work effectively. And such management systems exist. They can be quite effective in certain industries at certain times or at a certain scale, or for a certain period of time. There is an alternative perspective that if you generate opportunities and enable individuals to pursue their true passions, what genuinely interests them, and unlock their remarkable potential, it will result in the organization attaining extraordinary outcomes. In all likelihood, the first option is more suitable for achieving good, possibly average results. The second approach remains the approach of a company that aims to make a significant breakthrough beyond the average middle level in the fintech industry, distinguishing itself from others in the field. In actuality, this approach leads to the fact that management is primarily about individuals, not processes. Look, this is a very important statement. I often come across the situation when someone, a manager, a product manager, a project manager, approaches a project or a task, and someone starts thinking about how to build processes, while someone else starts thinking about who will do it. I believe that first and foremost, we need to think about who, and then think about how. And this, of course, these are two perspectives, and both approaches do not reject do not reject processes that emphasize the importance of people in decision-making and problem-solving. Focus on people does not mean that processes are not important. Just a question, what is primary, what is most important? I believe that processes without good people will not yield results. They will work formally, mechanically. Well, this will work, let's say, at most on average, and at the same time, good people involved understanding what they are doing, understanding the meaning. They can generally figure out how to work without processes at first and then create these processes using common sense. Here I would like to present one of the initial sections of the Agile Manifesto, which I regard as a remarkable piece of work consisting of four lines, emphasizing the significance of individuals and their interactions over processes and tools, but at the same time, while not denying the importance of the second, without denying the importance of processes and tools, we prioritize people and their interaction. If this is translated into another language, culture holds great significance for us. We believe that culture will not function without processes. Actually, culture and processes are likely integral to management as a whole. Management is a vital tool for effectively implementing ideas and bringing them to fruition in a practical and efficient manner. So we possess ideas, we possess strategies, and management is the way we execute it. We execute this through the utilization of culture and processes. Following that, what I would like to direct your attention to is the final outcome or result, rather than solely focusing on the research aspect of the tool. I have also come across many instances where people, having read numerous management books and witnessed how something functions, begin mechanically and rigidly applying certain management frameworks, let's say, in a very strict and inflexible manner without much flexibility or adaptability. In business, during this process, it becomes evident that the process itself, the means, becomes more significant than the ultimate goal, and the form starts to take precedence over the content that it represents. And here I want to say again to all of us, emphasize and for future colleagues, because after all, you need to think first of all about the meaning, about the form, because everything else is a tool and everything else can be changed because any framework is a convention. In any social science, it is not physics or mathematics. Any concept, whether it is a management concept, is a generalization, simplification, convention, and it cannot be implemented as an exact science due to its inherent nature of being abstract and context dependent. Thus, any framework has the potential to be modified. And above all, it is crucial to understand the underlying meaning and purpose of why this framework exists. And then we should be flexible, adaptive. And this approach in our history has led to the fact that we have consistently maintained and sustained such a flexible organizational structure throughout our entire existence. Our structure has constantly changed. And that girl who came to us 
the company, a growing company. She just didn't understand our organizational structure because it firstly really constantly changed because the business grew annually by 2% and occasionally by 3% and in certain years by four times its previous size. The count of individuals has experienced an increase. Our approaches have been altered. We consistently required to adapt and adjust, modify the structure of the organization. And we even established such a flexible organizational structure. Currently, this structure is being implemented in our Myro service platform. Where can everything be moved, changed? For some time in our central office in Moscow, the organizational structure was on a large magnetic board on which there were photos of us, colleagues, and you could actually draw teams with a marker when something changed with us, you could move it. In my general belief, the ability of an organization to consistently change its organizational structure resembling a living organism is an important and crucial factor of success that we must strive to preserve and maintain throughout. We must be ready to always understand that these processes, frameworks, this is important. We must negotiate about them. They must be open, understandable, but at the same time, we must be ready to change it at any moment, restructure, then we will be adaptive and change accordingly with the change of strategy, circumstances, the further the world changes faster for us. Currently, we typically behave in this manner. For instance, very recently, the configuration of worldwide marketing has undergone changes at our location. We just realized that during the planning phase, we began to take more active actions in international markets. We thought we needed one structure, now we understand that we need another, and we quickly changed. Each of us should be ready. This is an integral and significant part of our DNA. It is essential to note that we have a well-established and non-negotiable rule in place. I don't know, it seems to me that it hasn't been specifically documented anywhere yet, but many colleagues remember it. It's called no bullshit. If translated, it is quite censored. This will be no nonsense or nonsense. This rule means that at any given time, if any of us, from the leader to the developer, observes any behavior that appears to be formal in the company, the intended significance is diminished and greater emphasis is placed on the procedure or appearance. In such cases, the individual has the authority to raise a concern, communicate through our messaging platforms, and express their opinion that they believe this is nonsense. And each and every individual has the inherent right to possess this entitlement. This is an antibiotic that will enable our company to consistently obtain a signal indicating that we are gradually and progressively becoming more rigid and less adaptable in some aspect or another. Now I want to talk about how, from my point of view, our company may or may have been organized and how it is currently organized, how it was built from the very beginning and how its management was built. Look, where should I start? From what is the meaning of the existence of any organization, company, business? The meaning lies in creating value. Initially, I had an idea, then we all gathered together. We managed to attract resources, we made a profit, and we are creating something valuable for the world's benefit. And this value that we generate is the significance of the existence of our company. Because it is for this value that we receive, profit is not the meaning of the company's existence. The company's purpose goes beyond mere financial gain. After all, the purpose of a company's existence is the value that the company creates, which is the final product. Profit is a reward or evaluation, whether this value is needed by the world or not. And this meaning of the company's existence is our mission. I will reiterate it once again. We are involved in the creation of products and services in the field of public catering, catering to millions of people through our partnerships with entrepreneurs in the industry. This is a mass market, not a premium market. In partnership with our entrepreneurs in a franchise, using the opportunities that technologies give us. We aim to improve the daily lives of individuals by utilizing technology along with the energy and enthusiasm of our partner entrepreneurs. These entrepreneurs not only support our employees, but also contribute to the operation of our coffee makers and pizzerias, which are essential for creating products that reach a vast number of people. And further, understanding this mission, the entire organizational structure of the company reflects this chain of value creation. To put it differently, the structure is fundamentally an organism of sorts, wherein each team bears the responsibility for a particular component within this chain of creating value. 
thereby forming a cohesive and interdependent system that drives the overall value creation process. And I can envision, and every organizational structure has the potential to undergo alterations or modifications. It is a type of collective organism composed of numerous organs situated inside the structure. Everyone who has their own mission, and all of this can change in the process, just like in nature. Imagine that the organism exists, undergoes growth, can undergo changes because altering the strategy can result in a modification in the organizational structure. If we comprehend that it is crucial for the company at present, for instance, to generate a breakthrough or enhance something, then we modify the organizational structure. And this has an impact on the execution of the strategy. I usually envision the company as a living organism where each team has its own mission, as I already mentioned. Imagine, let's consider the human organism, for example. When you observe any organism created by nature or even a human being, you realize the profound beauty, the astonishing wonder, and the intricate complexity of it, where every element plays its designated role, its unique mission, and everything is intricately interconnected in a harmonious symphony of existence. And once again, it is not hierarchically interconnected, it is all such a complex and intricate large system. And Actually, this is how I imagine the company. I see these visually. I imagine these circles. What is the location of this place? The outer circle represents the area where we come into contact with the entirety of the world and have our interactions and experiences. The outer circle is the responsibility for strategy. That is the CEO, the board of directors, further the company. I will not show you any specific structure now. It is conditional because Again, like everything in the world is immutable, so is our company organization. It changes every day, possibly every hour. And that is the reason why I am currently drawing a simple schematic for you, indicating that inside this big circle, there are different teams, each with its own mission, and they collectively create value in this big value creation chain. And within these commands, there exist subcommands. The size of the business determines the number of organizers, and let's say the division inside into submission teams, which can progressively grow larger and larger as the business expands. Why did I draw circles instead of a hierarchy? In reality, I typed the word management in the keynote and you know what icon Apple recommended to me? It was a circle. I found it interesting how the concept of circles resonated with the idea of management in that context. The icon you are currently viewing is from the command tree. I wonder why, in my perception, visual company is always visually represented as circles. Perhaps it's because a circle touches other circles, the world around, the surface. This representation creates a sense of connection and unity. It's interesting how a simple shape can convey such meaning and evoke a certain perception. This signifies that connections, interactions transpire not solely in accordance with the designated hierarchy algorithm. All teams possess the capability to interact with one another, both at the level of their respective circle and in an upward, downward, and various other directions, facilitating a multi-directional flow of communication and collaboration. In reality, the hierarchical scheme assumes that commands situated at the same level do not interact with each other in any manner or form. This means that there is no communication or exchange of information between these commands as they are completely independent and operate in isolation within their respective levels of the hierarchy. Here you see the primary command is extremely left and extremely right. They can interact only practically, it turns out, through the upper, through three levels of hierarchy. This decelerates the movement of information, resulting in a slower flow of data and giving rise to all of these problems associated with hierarchical organizations and their inherent inefficiencies and complexities. Actually, the most important principle on which our company is currently built is leadership, ownership, delegation. This signifies that each and every product, every individual team, every distinct, let's say, organ of our living organism has a designated leader who is the rightful owner of the respective product, ensuring accountability and efficient decision making within the organization. In other words, owning means that he is responsible for the comprehensive implementation of the mission of this product. That is, the world is changing, circumstances are changing, he understands his responsibility, and this gives him flexibility. That is, it doesn't act under any circumstances under a location instruction that is dropped from somewhere. 
but based on the understanding of its mission in the general value creation chain. And delegation, that is, this leader is delegated responsibility for this product, responsibility and the ability to make decisions are entrusted to this leader by the team. So every product, every company, and every team within the company possesses a leader. Furthermore, it is important to note that this does not negate the fact that a team may have more than one leader, or there may be a holocratic structure in place. If the team is able to successfully accomplish its mission with the support of such an organization, and all members of the team possess the necessary competence and are willing to share responsibility, then it is quite possible that the team is organized in a holocratic manner, meaning it does not have one specific leader overseeing all operations. Simultaneously, as previously mentioned, at the level of each circle, every team has the ability to establish its own framework. One individual operates in an agile manner, another in waterfall, someone makes small flexible decisions, and someone else implements a grand vision. And it can frequently change, Someone might have objectives and key results if they are adopted at the company level. This does not mean that there must necessarily be objectives and key results within the team. I may be saying scary things right now. OKR system, I remind you that this stands for objective and key results. This is one of the frameworks that the company can work with. In short, it doesn't matter what color the cat is. The main thing is that it catches mice and at the same time does not violate our principles. In principle, we possess things that are unalterable for us. Simultaneously, transparency must be in existence at all moments. Every team is required to have a clearly defined product, mission, and specific metrics. This should be accessible to all individuals. In general, this system, you know, it assumes that everything is open, suggests that information is available, it is accessible, convenient, and user-friendly. Overall, we've always built this company. Our main principle of openness, to which I will dedicate an entire lecture in the near future, greatly contributes to this. It is imperative that we continue without any delay. Develop this information openness. In fact, I think that the most important element of the revolution in openness, decentralization of the organization, was made by messengers like Slack, which allow you to communicate not one-on-one -on -one or with a separate group, but to create channels can subscribe and be aware of what's happening, effectively connect information flows for oneself because there are also flows of different scales, flows of the whole company, the entire market, a specific team. Because communication in the previous era via email was considerably more closed off and limited in scope. Furthermore, we also have our very own traditional frameworks that are specifically designed to spread valuable knowledge and expertise among different companies and organizations. These are daily meetings. And I want to say again, I will repeat it again, that friends, daily meetings, this is what our company should stay forever. Let it be our tradition from the very beginning that every week, depending on the scale of the company, we gather on Monday morning where we talk about what happened in the company, about some key events. This allows all individuals to always be fully aware of and informed about the events that are happening at all times. Additionally, we possess a substantial quantity of knowledge sharing tools. This is a Congress. It takes place once a year, providing us with an opportunity to communicate our strategy, share our results, and engage with our partners, external counterparts, suppliers, and all colleagues. Frequently, meetings are dedicated to specific teams, demos, and undoubtedly, if we want to enhance our management system, we need to develop constant and reliable tools of information openness and transparency. The most crucial property without which the management system will not operate effectively is the ability to negotiate and make successful agreements with relevant parties. Due to the presence of these horizontal connections, confusion can often arise. In contrast, hierarchical systems provide clarity regarding decision-making as there is a clear chain of command with a boss, manager, and a pyramid structure, making it evident who is responsible for decision-making at each stage. In our system, there are numerous inquiries where everything intersects. Moreover, this ability to negotiate is a vital skill that we need to develop and strengthen. Simultaneously, this does not imply that we are compromising. In certain instances, when teams are unable to reach an agreement, particularly when they are at an equal level, the ultimate decision is made by the owner, 
the individual who possesses the outer circle. Because ultimately someone must decide because compromises, as you know, in some cases do not yield positive outcomes. They lead to a certain middle ground, so to speak, and do not allow for any major breakthroughs to occur. Be capable of negotiating what we require. Firstly, we must comprehend the overarching objectives, namely the organization strategy, which ought to be unambiguous. This is not only a question of information openness, but also, let's say, the ability to clearly, precisely, simply formulate a strategy, because the further we go, the more business there will be. However, regardless of the type of business, it is essential to have the ability to generalize and effectively communicate our strategy to anyone. Actually, there are strategies not only for the entire company, but also for teams and for markets, and everyone should understand them and focus primarily on common goals. We need to establish a culture. Everything I have written is interconnected. We need to establish a culture of trust when we accept and believe that everyone in the company acts in the best interests of the company as a whole. If we don't trust, that means we don't believe that a person acts in the best interests, something happened, some deception, then we cannot work, then the system will collapse. This is an extremely important principle. All of this, once again, is interconnected and leads to the fact that we do not have key performance indicators. I would like to remind you what KPI is. I have a comprehensive lecture dedicated to this topic. This is the moment when we tie our specific results to material short-term rewards. And as a result, this leads to teams having a wide range of different conflicts of interest that need to be addressed. And it is destroyed, leading to the fact that it can lead to the destruction of understanding common goals. With one KPI, the entire company is measured by its capitalization. Capitalization, which includes the value of the stock and the company, represents an assessment of the market based on current and future results. As such, a comprehensive indicator assessing both the present and the future. When we have only one, in fact, QPI in the form of capitalization, we all understand that we all, no matter where we are, in which team we are now, in marketing Eurasia or in business development drink it. We are building one big company that ultimately creates this one big value, fulfills this mission. Well, and openness. Openness when all motives are clear, all information is clear, all of this creates trust once again, rebuilding trust. We need to preserve all of this in order for our system to function properly. She has the ability to work with incredible efficiency. The presence of openness is of utmost significance as it serves as the primary determining factor for the existence of this living organism. Is there a hierarchical structure in our organization and in such a management system, friends? Certainly, yes, it does exist. Because on certain occasions, due to certain reasons, our company was referred to as turquoise or holocratic externally, and now I am elaborating on it further. However, I would not describe our company as turquoise or holocratic. The reason for this is that it is an effort to associate some level of structure and conventionality, as I have already mentioned. All of these social systems are contingent and simplified when applied to our company. I think methodologically this is wrong because we are once again a living organism, but simultaneously we have holocratic elements in the turquoise company. However, in the classic sense, we are not a turquoise company, nor are we a holocratic company. Why? Due to the presence of hierarchy, there are different levels of responsibility and decision making. Because we have an understanding that the wider the circle, the more responsibility it entails for the business. As the level of communication increases, the level of responsibility also increases, requiring a higher level of competence to make informed decisions effectively. And we comprehend that the company is unable to I understand manage in a manner that enables every individual to competently make all of the decisions. And that is why we strive to ensure that individuals with the appropriate experience and competence are appointed to leadership positions, as it is vital to have a strong alignment between the level of responsibility and the capabilities of the person in charge. And a crucial point is that the determination regarding the individual who will assume leadership of particular teams is still made by the leader of the external circle as they ultimately bear the responsibility for the outcome within this circle. At the same time, we adhere to and uphold a fundamental principle of delegation in all our endeavors. This indicates that the leader of the outer circle plus one is unable to decide the leaders of the circle beneath him, 
as this is determined by the external leader of that circle. The terms inside or outside are used to describe this hierarchical relationship. Consequently, the leader of the outer circle plus one lacks authority in selecting leaders in the lower circle, as it is decided by the external leader of that circle, who is not part of these teams. And in actuality, this particular system, our system must be constructed and developed based on trust and meritocracy. Meritocracy is the leadership of the worthy, and trust is based on the belief that if someone occupies a leadership position, it means it's not just for nothing, but because they have earned it. Even if we disagree with his decision in some cases, even though the leader is always our leader, Dodo leader should make an effort to explain it, clarify his logic, then we have faith that if the company, if the leader of the external circle has entrusted him with this product, this mission, then he is acting with the best motives. We will help with this, and then practice will show the results, how well this leader can cope with it, how much his competence corresponds to the level of responsibility or the complexity of the task at hand. In our system, all individuals have the opportunity to access information and express their opinion on any matter because each person's viewpoint is genuinely valuable and can contribute meaningfully. It is crucial to comprehend that the decision in this particular case is made by the individual who holds the responsibility. This is a significant notion for grasping the system of ownership. Due to the fact that even on certain occasions, our partners have been known to mention that we do not adequately perceive or comprehend their communications. I ask a question, why don't you hear? And how do you make a decision as you see fit? I am expressing that we are attentive to your concerns. However, we acknowledge and stand by our decision. This does not imply that we do not listen to what you are saying. Perhaps our perspective, our decision differs from yours. But since we bear the ultimate accountability for this product, for a certain level of responsibility, we are the ones who make the final decision. And it is crucial to comprehend clearly that the individual who takes the decision is the one who is responsible for it. And he, of course, must make an effort to listen to everyone because that is how he can make a decision that is more balanced and considerate of all perspectives. As I have already indicated, can we designate our system using the term holacracy? No. Why? Because holocraft is a system that organizes itself in a self-organizing and autonomous manner. The system, which you do not fully understand, is uncertain in terms of where it will ultimately lead and requires further exploration. This is a living organism that possesses the capability to grow from the bottom and teams have the freedom to carry out whatever actions they deem necessary while fully understanding their function and purpose. But we operate in a unique manner because we possess the freedom to take action, yet this freedom is constrained by the framework of the strategy that has been adopted. If we possess a company-wide strategy, and strategy is in reality what we will do and what we will not do, then there are not numerous strategies. It is a concentration on something. This already imposes restrictions on the freedom of the entire company. This is a discipline of strategy. We possess a shared strategy that we collectively employ and implement to achieve our goals and objectives in a unified and coordinated manner. She is approved by the CEO and the board of directors. Furthermore, the board of directors does not formulate a strategy. In certain situations, he is only capable of uttering the word no. If he responds negatively, it may indicate his viewpoint. But this means that the strategy needs to be redone or in general, everything needs to be completely changed. But first and foremost, SEO develops and adopts a strategy, but naturally he doesn't do it alone. He achieves this by working closely with team leaders across the entire company, as it is an established and structured process that requires collaboration and coordination at every level. I made sketches of my directors, CEO, and team leaders. The drawing included directors, CEOs, team leaders, and circle leaders. This is collective creativity, but since we have a chief executive officer in the company who ultimately bears responsibility, the final decision should be understood by the chief executive officer as much as possible. It's like it's settled. But you need to understand, the more you comprehend, the larger the scale of responsibility, the more collegial participation there is. At the sea level, there is also a board of directors. And in addition, there is a large team of strong managers who play a crucial role in the organization's success.
smaller products, possibly at some level, where an individual works alone in the team and such products can exist. In reality, every single one of us essentially generates a certain amount of insignificant value in the end. In all, he has the ability to make decisions independently, but his choices are influenced by the strategy of his team, his circle of trusted individuals. Each of us will do whatever he wants, even if it is within limits. In the absence of functions or missions, it is evident that the company will not operate as a cohesive organism, as a living entity. Consequently, we will be unable to execute the strategy, thereby hindering our ability to achieve our goals and objectives. Having a well-defined strategy is crucial in navigating this highly competitive and complex world. It is very important that all strategies are explained. Look, yes, the strategy is actually coming down. That is, it is discussed at the level. When it is discussed, everyone participates in the discussion of the strategy. When she enters the circle, she is already accepted. That is, we need to implement her into our plans. And actually, the discipline of strategy means that we are able to implement the strategy. We discussed it first, but openness is very important. And it is important to explain that we should not only formally obtain the strategy, we should understand it. Because only by understanding the strategy, we will be able to implement it at the level of our responsibility. Because at the level of our responsibility within the framework of the strategy, there is freedom, freedom in implementation. It is the responsibility of each person to do as they see fit, again, based on the principles and strategy in the conditions of the resources available to the company and the team. Is it possible to fully immerse oneself in the inner circles at all? I was frequently asked if you, Fedor, came to a team and stated how it should be done, as if changing a button in an application, is it considered micromanagement? In point of fact, we strictly adhere to a fundamental principle of delegation in our organization. We really give responsibility, give freedom to make decisions at the level of our product. But at the same time, let's say, within the framework of some coaching, knowledge transfer, the company is growing quickly. Not everyone has enough experience. From the perspective of training, it is more responsible for a leader to approach a smaller project and provide assistance with something. It's quite normal, but it should all be within the framework of education and coaching, not in terms of directive, because then it will all come to micromanagement and hierarchical structure. How do I see the ideal organization? You know, I recently, approximately six months ago, uh, watched a podcast about an octopus, specifically about the fascinating brain of the octopus creature. And the octopus, similar to everything in nature, is truly an astonishing and remarkable creature. However, the octopus possesses a unique and remarkable feature, which is its decentralized nervous system. What does this mean? And why is it significant? What the octopus actually has is a central brain, but at the same time, there is a certain local nerve center located in each tentacle, which is capable not only of transmitting a signal to the brain, which must make a decision, but it can make a decision itself. In reality, a tentacle has the ability to make independent decisions without relying on a central brain, demonstrating its autonomy. However, simultaneously, the central brain continues to exist. As it brings together, it organizes, and it remains accountable for the functioning. The whole organism, otherwise everything would have scattered, and one tentacle would not know what the other is doing. But at the same time, there is decentralization, the ability to make decisions. I see that our management system should be like an octopus, where everyone understands the strategy, everyone understands the meaning of the mission, everyone understands their product, and at the same time can make decisions independently. Because it is precisely decision-making responsibility that allows one to grow. And this gives the opportunity for those who want to increase their responsibility, to have more influence, to achieve more, having experience and larger areas of responsibility. And as our business grows in size, the corresponding increase in these areas of responsibility will be significant, owing to the numerous opportunities that arise from operating a large scale business. During our childhood, we had a scarcity of resources and tools. As we mature, an increasing number of windows, doors, and opportunities unfold before us. We gain the ability to invest more 
and innovate with more fascinating technologies.